Xin thưa quý vị để mở đầu cho những cái chương trình làm việc sáng nay Chúng tôi xin uh, giới thiệu và kính mời uh, giáo sư Romila Thapa Sẽ trình bày cái chủ đề về thay đổi chủ đề làm sáng tỏ lịch sử Ấn Độ của bắt đầu because as you are all aware, history is a kind of discipline in which a certain body of information about the past continues to be handed on, but the interpretation of that information often changes due to a variety of reasons. The interpretation may change because uh, the people who are writing the history change. The interpretation may change because the, if the state is involved in the writing of history, as it has been for centuries all over the world, when the state changes, the writing of history changes somewhat. Um, and therefore, this is a process that continues uh, from time immemorial. Now, I am not going to be talking about the way in which history was written in the past in India, because that is a complicated subject. I will talk about the way in which, in the last 200 years or so, the interpretation of Indian history has changed, and what it is that we historians today in India are centrally concerned with. Let me begin, therefore, with what we inherited in 1947 when India became independent. We had two traditions of historical writing. There was the colonial interpretation of Indian history, and there was a nationalistic reaction to that interpretation. This is something which is a very common story in many of our societies that have been through the experience of having been the colonies of a European country. The colonial interpretation in India was the first attempt to try and write a kind of modern history of India. And so <clears throat> a study was made in relation to the early period. Um, a study was made of the texts written in Sanskrit and some written in Persian later on. Um, and the story as it was given by this scholarship was that Indian history is to be divided into three periods of study. What was called the Hindu period, which was the earliest, going from 1500 BC to about 1000 AD. And then the Muslim period, which went from 1000 AD to about 1750 AD. And then the British period, with the arrival of British colonialism. <clears throat> now what this did was to split Indian history into three big periods, very big. In the first case, it was 2,500 uh, 2, years, all of one period of history. And to give them religious labels. This is the first time in Indian history that the past was looked at with religious labels. This was a colonial interpretation. The second uh, way of looking at the past was to talk, from the point of view of colonial history, was to talk about oriental despotism. Now this is an inheritance which I think all of us in Asia and Africa share. The colonial writers of history always described our societies as despotic. 
and the picture that was presented was that you had a ruler, a, a pyramid structure of society in which there was a ruler at the top and there was a base of a subordinate peasantry that was producing the income. And this subordinate peasantry was controlled through a bureaucracy. And so the issue of despotic rule, bureaucratic administration, and a subordinate peasantry became the picture in which history was presented. Um, the third aspect was that caste society in India was regarded as racially segregated. In other words, this notion of race, which is completely alien to Indian thinking, was introduced in the 19th century because it was the dominant notion in Europe. There was talk about the science of race. Um, and this racial entity was introduced, and it was argued that each caste represents a separate race. And a caste, therefore, was seen as race, not as social, uh, uh, a social hierarchy, which is, in fact, the way it should be seen. And finally, it was said that Indian society was a completely static, unchanging society that right from the beginning up to the time when the British colonial arrived on the scene, there had been no historical change. That is for 2,500 years. Now today, of course, when one looks at this argument, when one says this is absolutely absurd, how can you have a society that doesn't change? But it was an idea that was implicitly accepted at that time. Now the next school that came in after this was what we call the School of Nationalist Historians. Uh, the late 19th century, the early 20th century in India was dominated by a nationalist ideology. There was a struggle for national independence from colonialism. And there were many historians that were influenced by the nationalist ideology. So what was their reaction to colonial history? They accepted the periodization of Hindu, Muslim, and British. A few, however, changed it to ancient, medieval, and modern. But the point of change remained the same. Namely, the early period, the ancient period, was the period when you had Hindu rulers. Then the medieval period, or the Muslim period, was when rules switched to Muslim families and Muslim dynasties. And then with the coming of the British, you had the modern period, which was that of not Christian India, but British India. That's an interesting distinction. So the periodization was accepted and was not questioned for a long time to come. This is in part what led finally to people in India in the 19th and 20th centuries looking at themselves, looking at Indian society as a conglomeration, a collection of religious communities. And the issue of religious community became very important. Now this is, I think, very crucial to all our societies where we have religious communities today or where we talk about ethnic differences. The word ethnic is also a very complex word and needs to be extremely carefully defined. Anyway, we inherited this notion of religious communities through the interaction of colonial and nationalist history writing. Oriental despotism was, of course, rejected, quite obviously, because people didn't want to accept or believe or argue in favor of the pre-modern system in India having been despotic. And quite rightly so, because it wasn't despotic in every case. There were occasional moments of despotism, but uh, not entirely. 
there was some work done on economic history, but not too much. There was just a general re uh, rejection of this idea. Caste also began to be seen as a form of the stratification and hierarchy of society rather than just race. And this is an important contribution that was made by Indian nationalist historians together with sociologists, Indian sociologists. And this is the first time in history, in the writing of Indian history, that you get interdisciplinary research. That is, the sociologists and the historians were sitting together and looking at the history of caste, not in terms of racial separation, but in terms of social stratification. Um, there was also, of course, the uh, notion that the ancient period of history was the golden age. Now, this is not typical of Indian nationalism. It occurs in every nationalism all over the world, European nationalism included, even though it was not an anti-colonial nationalism. The, uh, the idea is that nationalism is always searching for a period in the past which can be regarded as absolutely harmonious, peaceful, brilliant, where everything was marvelous. What the great historian Eric Hobsbawm has called the opium of nationalism is history. And taking up this opium, there is the, the emphasis is always on a remote and ancient period. Uh, why do they choose a remote period? Because uh, it is difficult to be very precise about what was happening in a remote period. The sources of the ancient past tend to be much more complicated than the sources of the more recent past with which we are familiar. And therefore, the golden age in the Indian context of periodization became the Hindu period. This was the most ancient, this was the period about which we knew the least, and therefore we could fantasize on this period. And this is a notion and an idea which has not died down, which is still there, which is now taking on all kinds of other dimensions as well, but one has to keep it in mind when one studies um, Indian history, and particularly uh, the kind of studies I make, which is of the very early period. The one person who did raise the question of was it a golden age and was caste merely social stratification was not a historian, but a lawyer, come politician, uh, come very intelligent, intellectually very interesting person on the Indian scene, Dr. Ambedkar, who led the movement of the Dalit community, uh, the Dalits being the, the lowest level of caste hierarchy, outside caste, the untouchables. And he was the one who brought them together and, and led the movement. In fact, the one who converted or asked many Dalits to convert to Buddhism, what we today call Neo-Buddhism. And Ambedkar raised this question for the historian, saying caste is not just hierarchy, because when you study a society of the past, you're not just looking at hierarchy, you're also looking at the question of dominance and subordination. Which members of which castes were dominant and which were subordinated. So that this unequal relationship is an extremely as uh, important aspect of social history. Now, in the 1950s and the 60s, when we all began our tentative entry into research, uh, especially in the 60s and then going on into the 70s, there was a major change in the interpreting of Indian history, what some of us have called a shift of the paradigm, a shift of the way in which one looked at history. 
And how did this shift come about? It came about, first of all, by saying, do we accept the theories that were put forward by colonial interpretation and by nationalist interpretation? Or do we look for theories which would be more supportive of turning history, history into a social science? So what this meant was that you began a lot of interdisciplinary work. You brought in social anthropology and sociology, you brought in economic anthropology, uh, you brought in population studies, the studies of the history of religion, and so on. So that history moved from being simply the narrative of kings and queens and battles and events, the narrative of those in authority, and it began to be looked upon as the narrative of the entire society, from the elite groups right down to the lowest caste groups, wherever there was evidence for it. So one of the questions that we began with was the question of the state. How did the state evolve in India? And we discovered then that far from being a static society, there was a tremendous change going on all the time in early Indian history. Uh, and the major change was the change from clan societies, which existed early on, to kingdoms. The clan society gradually broke up and evolved into kingdoms. Now this is demonstrated very interestingly in the two texts that you might be familiar with. Uh, one is the great epic, the Mahabharat, which is essentially the conflict of clans. And the other is the other epic, the Ramayana, uh, which again is something that you would know, which is different because it is the conflict of the kingdom versus clan society. And, you know, this is uh, the, the change from clan to kingdom comes through very clearly in an epic text like the Ramayana. The other thing that struck us was that there's a difference between a state and an empire. Now, in colonial historical writing, every dynasty is referred to as an empire. And so you had in India the empire of the Nambas, the Mauryas, the Satavahanas, the Vakarnakas, the Guptas. It went on. Every dynasty was an empire. And some of us questioned this and said there is a difference between an imperial system and a state system, a kingdom. And so that different difference came in and became very important to the study of political history as the concept of history. And then, of course, when one begins to study empire, uh, one has to look at how is this vast expanse of territory governed. And so the suggestion came up that within a system of administration, you have some aspects that are, some areas that are highly centralized in administration. You have other areas which are less centralized. And you have other areas where the administration is quite peripheral. And so one begins to look upon administration not as every kingdom had a centralized administration and controlled every part of the territory, but that there was a differentiation. There was a difference. Some areas were directly controlled, others were less directly controlled, others were very lightly controlled. Now, this difference is important in the study of looking at how states evolve their notion of power, authority, administration, and so on. Um, and, and this becomes an important issue. This then also questions the notion of periodizing history according to the religion of the dynasties. It didn't really matter that the dynasties from uh, 1000 BC to 1000 AD were all the dynasties that were Hindu and Buddhist. Because what was important was to study the nature of the state, the nature of the kingdom that was being administered and being ruled. And in that context, therefore, 
the British periodization of Hindu, Muslim, and British was set aside and a new periodization was brought in, much more closely related to historical change. The economy too, um, under the colonial system of course, the focus was on the agrarian economy. And it was economic history for many, many decades, even in the 20th century, was essentially the agrarian economy that was studied. Everywhere people were looking at uh, agriculture and the agrarian economy. But about 30, 40 years ago, uh, there was the discovery or there was the realization that in fact there was a huge maritime economy that also accompanied the land based agrarian economy. And then one began to see the beginnings of what some of us have called. Uh, the Indian Ocean Arc. That is the maritime economy that linked up uh, first to begin with Egypt, the Red Sea, India, going to the Southeast Asian uh, Peninsula and the islands, going to South China. And this maritime economy, starting with the Roman trade in the second century BC, changing into various kinds of trade by Indian traders in smaller or larger segments, and ultimately being taken over by Arab traders by about the 12th, 14th centuries AD. Uh, this maritime economy had a link which went from Tunisia to Egypt to the Red Sea to South India, to Sri Lanka, to all the ports of Southeast Asia, the period when places like Orkeo were extremely important, um, to Canton. Now, when you look at this link, this maritime link, and by then there was an overland link too, going via the Eastern Mediterranean through Central Asia to China. Uh, some of us began saying, well, you know, if you're going to talk about a globalized economy, the Eurasian globalized economy goes back to this period. So that there is a sense in which uh, today's globalization is a kind of continuation, as it were, of course, taking in a much, much bigger area. The new world was not known at that time. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that you look at maritime economies, not simply in terms of these were the ports and these were the goods that were traded, but then you also get into this question of what were the ideas that traveled. And it is these ideas that bring, together with the ships and merchants, they bring the Buddhist monks, they bring the Brahmins, they bring all kinds of other cultural items which also get traded. And so then you begin talking, one begins talking about things like bilingualism in many parts of Afghanistan and Central Asia. The two languages that were dominant were Prakrit and Greek for long periods. Similarly, in Southeast Asia, you really cannot study Southeast Asia without knowing the Khmer language, Javanese, and Sanskrit. And the interaction of these languages, the, the way the languages were used, is extremely important, uh, both in terms of the history of language and in terms of the history of commerce. Um, who were the merchants then who traveled? We began to ask these questions. Uh, some were the straightforward members of the mercantile community, uh, caste-wise, it was largely the Vaishyas, but at the same time, what this kind of trade and commerce does is to break down the rules of social stratification. It broke the rules of caste because you had, for example, the Brahman caste, which supposedly was not allowed to cross the seas because there was all this problem of you practice rituals, you know how to practice rituals in your own country, in your own land. You cannot practice those rituals in a foreign country. 
So it was said, Brahmins better stay at home and not travel too much. Yet, it is the Brahmins who travel all the way uh, from the Red Sea through to the South China Seas to Canton. What are they taking? They're taking ritual, yes, but they're also taking administration. They're bringing in ideas of administration. And they're bringing in trade. The major trading guilds, the really important, what would be the equivalent of today's corporates, were the trading guilds from South India, the Ayavole 500 and the Pigils of that kind, uh, all Brahman controlled. Because the Brahmins controlled the land economy, so the surplus from the land was put into trade, and they took the trade to Southeast Asia. So what I'm trying to suggest is that when one looks at something like a caste society, and there are many texts which describe the caste society as the Brahmins are only those who can pray and who have a, a, a focus, a monopoly of learning. The Kshatriyas are those who are the warriors. The Vaishyas are those who trade, and so on. These rules get broken when these economies change. <coughs> so, what I'm trying to suggest is that there are two different ways of looking at trade which ultimately have to be integrated. One is the economy of the trade, the other is the social groups involved. Um, and this has effect then on caste societies. The other very important aspect is uh, the creation of caste. Uh, for example, <coughs> For example, uh, when a caste society or a kingdom moves into a new area, in the case of the subcontinent, it was very often the forested areas where the people were living were called the forest peoples or the hill tribes. And I gather that even in Southeast Asia there is a distinction between the plains people and the society of the plains people and the society of the hill tribes. What happened? There was an interaction. And the society of the plains people then cleared the forests, converted the forest tribes into peasant cultivators, and this became new territory for the kingdom. And in this process, the caste hierarchy was also introduced. And I would be interested to know, for example, that in many parts of Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia, in the old kingdoms, when the Brahmins came in with their ritual, and why were they accepted so easily? Was it because they argued that they had the ritual by which they could confer status on people? They could legitimize rulers, which is what they were doing in many parts of the Indian subcontinent. When they moved in and set up their system of functioning, as it were, did they bring caste with them? And this is a problem that has bothered me ever since we arrived in Vietnam, and I've been asking everybody. In the old days, when you had the kingdoms of Funan and Champa, um, did was there caste? And if there was caste, what has happened to it? How did it decline? How did it disappear? But anyway, that, that is my, my question. The other aspect that we are very interested in in social history is, of course, the aspect of gender history. What was the role of women in early societies, in pre-modern societies? We were all brought up on the idea that there were these two women who were philosophers in the ancient, described in the ancient Upanishads, the Vedic texts. And these two women philosophers, Gargi and Maitreyi, um, 
were so brilliant that they completely, uh, as it were, mentally disabled the great philosopher Jan Valkia by asking him very difficult questions. And so everybody started saying, you see, the position of women was great. It was absolutely tremendous because you had these women philosophers. And everybody respected women. What historians in those days forgot that the same texts also talk about the Dasis, the female slaves, who were treated as jackal. When you counted your wealth in those days, you said, I have 10,000 head of horse, I have 60,000 cattle, and I have 500 female slaves. They were jackal, they were counted as wealth. And this gives you a kind of different idea of the status of women in those times. And this is true of every society all over the world. This is true of all early societies, where the distinction between the elite and the common people was very, very marked and very strong. But this is an aspect in which we are now beginning to do research and to try and discover uh, what were the avenues open to women in these early societies? What were the kinds of uh, occupations that they would have? Buddhism, for example, is markedly different from Hinduism because it very early on gives women the alternative choice of either being a housewife or becoming a nun. So you may think that becoming a nun is a very limiting of an occupation. But when you think about the nunneries that existed in those days and the monasteries and the inscriptions that these women have left at sacred sites, stupa sites like Sanchi and Barhut and Ajanta and so on, beautiful poems describing how liberated they feel now that they have stopped being housewives and doing the chores of housekeeping, but have become nuns. Now, it's a limited choice, but at least the choice is there. Uh, so we go on, and we go on talking about these things and uh, seeing how it affected um, other aspects as well. The study of religion, then, becomes a very important study uh, because religion also changes. In fact, religion is a kind of um, a very clear indicator of social change. Religion never remains the same from century to century. Always changes, and this is true as much of India and all the Indian religions, uh, starting with Vedic Brahmanism, Buddhism and Jainism, Puranic Hinduism, Tantric Shakta comes coming into Islam, the different sects of Islam, and so on. So we have now taken to asking ourselves the question that religion has two aspects. One is the text, the theory, the theoretical aspect. What are the texts that people are producing? What are they saying in these texts? What do they tell us about the society of that time? The second aspect is that all religions that wish to be authoritative and powerful, such as Buddhism, such as Shaivism and Vaishnavism and so on, have to have social organizations. They have to be organized. So you have Buddhist monasteries, you have Shaiva Machs, which are the equivalents of the, of the monasteries. Um, and we as historians then are now studying what was the social role of these religious organizations? There's one study of the texts, but the other more immediate study in terms of its impact on society is the social role of these organizations. And we find to our, our great surprise that the Buddhist monasteries, for example, right through central India and the peninsula in the period from the second century BC to the fourth century AD are the trading points where traders come and hold, and the monasteries themselves are indulging in trade. This is, of course, completely against the rules of the Buddha. Uh, 
Uh, but of course, with, as in all religions, teachings are one thing, practice is another. And it is the business of the historian to juxtapose the teaching with the practice and see why the practice differs from the teaching, where it differs from the teaching. So there is that. Um, and, and this is something which I think would be extremely relevant to Southeast, Southeast Asian history, where you had the monuments, you had the information about Buddhist centers, about Shaiva monuments, about Vaishnav centers, and so on. But you now need to understand how they express themselves at a social and political level. Um, let me conclude then by saying that what I have tried to do in this very brief talk is to give you some idea of the changes that have taken place in the study of early Indian history. It is now very, very different from what it was 40, 50 years ago. Um, the, the story is no longer the story of elite activities and events that only concern rulers. The story is now of the total society in as much as a historian can reconstruct the levels of society other than just the level of the elite. I have a reason for describing uh, these changes because I think that the early history of Southeast Asia, certainly Vietnam is very much a major part of it, is closely tied with the kinds of changes that were going on in the Indian subcontinent as well. Now, I'm not referring to direct links, I'm referring to processes of change. The processes of change that were taking place in the subcontinent, some of these processes seem to be reflected in Southeast Asian history as well. And this is something that needs investigation. I am not here referring to the old-fashioned theory and thesis of the Indianization, what uh, George Sirius was so fond of calling the Indianization of the states of Southeast Asia. Uh, the notion of Indianization as the notion of all civilizations is today very problematic. Because remember that the definition of a civilization, a demarcated territory, a single language, a single religion, is a colonial definition. And in the Indian context, it was the Indian subcontinent, it was the Sanskrit language, it was the Hindu religion. That is how colonial history saw India. And therefore, Indianization always means the importing of these items into other parts of the world. But today, we regard civilization not as being tightly demarcated territory, but porous boundaries, boundaries that are open. And why are they open? They're open because the very definition of civilization is the interaction, the interface, the intercommunication of cultures. You cannot have a civilization that is cut off from the rest of the world. A civilization can only come into being when it is in very deep contact with cultures to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south. And therefore, the notion of a distinctively separate, isolated culture is a notion that we no longer accept. The Indian-Southeast Asian relationship is therefore one, as I see it, of comparing parallels. Were there parallel developments? What were the developments? To what extent was the process of historical change in Southeast Asia similar to India? To what extent was it different? I think these are the questions that we need to look at uh, very much now. And we need to study them from a perspective of comparison rather than going on speaking of influences one way or the other. 
Um, the establishment of kingdoms, for instance, in the region of Southeast Asia, has a very strong echo of the establishment of kingdoms in the remoter parts of the Indian subcontinent. Now, what we need to do is to ask ourselves, is this echo really legitimate, or are we imagining that it is an echo? Let us look at these parallel developments and study them uh, much more closely. So what we need is Indian historians who study Southeast Asia, and Southeast Asian historians who study India. And here I would like to say that there are two kinds of agencies that are uh, very important. Uh, one is that I think that the old notion of area studies is something that perhaps we should reconsider at this point. We have found in our experience, and especially at my university, the Nehru University in Delhi, we found that if we set up a separate place for the study of a particular area, it didn't really latch on to the major studies that were happening in that discipline. For example, if one, is, one has a center for historical studies, if you have two or three people who are specialists in Southeast Asia located in the Department of Historical Studies studying Indian history, Chinese history, European history, it becomes a much more integrated study than having a separate department of just this country or that country or the other. But this is something that you know is very much uh, a personal experience that I'm talking of. I may be completely wrong in this. The second thing is, of course, very important, that this change that I have been describing, it can perhaps be summarized in one phrase, and that is that early Indian history today, which in colonial times was regarded as what was called Indology, it was labeled as Indology, and Indology carries all those colonial overtones and undertones. That now ceases to exist in India. We refer to early Indian history, to ancient Indian history, to pre-modern Indian history as a part of the social <laughs> sciences. And I think this shift from Indology into the social sciences is a very important shift and is something which I hope will be very helpful to the kind of comparative studies that I have been speaking of. Thank you. Xin rất là cảm ơn giáo sư Romila Tapa với một cái bài phát biểu rất là ngắn gọn, một cái bài giảng rất là ngắn gọn nhưng đã nêu lên rất nhiều những vấn đề mà tôi nghĩ rằng là sẽ gợi cho chúng ta nhiều câu hỏi. Trong đó có những vấn đề về cái cách tiếp cận nghiên cứu về uh, lịch sử uh, phải thay đổi. Uh, ví dụ như là trước đây đấy thì lịch sử thường nghiên cứu về chủ yếu thể hiện lịch sử vua chúa thể hiện các cái giai cấp thống trị các cái triều đại nhưng bây giờ rõ ràng là cái cách tiếp cận làm thế nào đó để nghiên cứu một cách toàn diện về xã hội nghiên cứu về văn hóa về văn minh đấy là những cái nội dung mà tôi nghĩ rằng là hết sức là quan trọng và thứ hai nữa là trong cái công tác nghiên cứu lịch sử đấy kể cả đây là một cái chủ đề nghiên cứu về lịch sử ấn độ cổ đại thì rõ ràng là cần bên cạnh cái việc nghiên cứu khu vực học cần có một cái sự nghiên cứu kết hợp giữa cái khu vực học với lại đặt nó trong cái mối liên hệ tổng thể với toàn bộ với lại các cái khu vực xung quanh thì tôi nghĩ rằng cái này sẽ gợi ra rất nhiều cho các nhà nghiên cứu trong đó có các nhà nghiên cứu Việt Nam chúng tôi khi mà nghiên cứu về lịch sử cổ đại Việt Nam bởi lẽ chúng tôi chịu ảnh hưởng rất nhiều trong cái thời kỳ này đấy của văn hóa độ văn hóa và văn minh Ấn Độ trong cái cách tổ chức nhà nước hoặc là trong văn học nghệ thuật và nhiều cái lĩnh vực khác của không chỉ ở Đại Việt ở, 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 ở Âu Lạc mà còn hai cái quốc gia sau này sẽ là hình thành cái nước Việt Nam hiện đại sau này đấy ví dụ như là Vương quốc Trăm Ba và Vương quốc Phù Nam thì tôi nghĩ rằng đây sẽ gợi ra rất nhiều cái nội dung mà chúng ta có cái khoảng thời gian để trao đổi thảo luận thì chúng tôi rất mong là quý vị sẽ dành cái phần này vào cái uh, tiếp theo
question of the widespread of uh, Buddhism in the early period, wide decline. Uh, let's not forget that there was a time when Buddhism was uh, the religion of virtually the entire Indian subcontinent. And I'm speaking of the period uh, roughly the turn of the Christian era. And it was subsequent to this that Buddhist missions uh, went out from India into Afghanistan, Central Asia, and finally China, and then from uh, coastal India to Southeast Asia, and also uh, up to China. The question then is that why after the 7th century AD, that is after many centuries of having been a pretty important religion, equal on par, with Brahmanism in India, why did it decline? Um, there have been various theories that have been put forward for this. Uh, one, uh, initially people used to say, oh, it was because of the uh, Islamic invasions. We now know that the decline of Buddhism began earlier, much before the Islamic invasions. We know this because there was a Chinese pilgrim, there were in fact two or three Chinese pilgrims, who traveled to India to collect the uh, texts from Buddhist monasteries, uh, one of whom the best known is Xuanxiang. Um, and he records that in certain areas there is a decline of the monasteries and the Deva temples, as he calls them, the Hindu temples, uh, were drawing larger crowds. So that there is an element of competition between Buddhism and Brahmanism. The point to keep in mind, of course, is that the religion, the, the, the observance and the belief system and so on of Hinduism at this time changed. It changed from what we call Vedic Brahmanism to what we call Puranic Hinduism. By Puranic Hinduism, I mean the worship of deities like Shiva, Vishnu, Durga, and so on. That is the Hinduism that traveled, for example, to Southeast Asia. Not the Vedic Brahmanism, but the Puranic Hinduism. Now, the Puranic Hinduism borrows a great deal from the organizational structure of Buddhism. For the first time, you begin to get Shaivite monasteries, semi-monasteries. You begin to get Shaivite preachers who go out taking the religion of Shiva to different parts of India and beyond India. So there's a certain borrowing of the organization of missionary work, uh, which begins at this time. And so there's a competition with Buddhism. And the patronage, the royal patronage, which was the big patronage in those days, the money bags all came from kings and queens. Um, that shifted gradually from Buddhism to Puranic Hinduism. And that was one reason uh, for, for the decline. Why did it shift to Puranic Hinduism? One was, of course, you know, the ability of Hinduism to incorporate the local religions of the area. Wherever it went, the local religion was brought in and a new text would be composed and there would be a mix of the mythology of uh, what we call classical Hinduism and the local religion as well. And this has been going on all the way through, which is why now the practice of Hinduism is becoming very uniform uh, in the subcontinent, but earlier on it varied very much from region to region. And when you saw a ritual being performed and a deity being worshipped, you could tell which part of the subcontinent that ritual came from because it was very typical. Now, there was one other very important reason, which is that the Hindu priests, when they performed rituals, were recompensed, were given grants of land. A whole area, sometimes a whole village, sometimes vast acreages of cultivated land, sometimes vast acreages of forest land, which the Brahmins then went and cleared 
and established uh, peasants, took peasants with them, or converted the local tribes people into peasants. And the Brahmins then became landowners, and this became a hereditary occupation. In fact, in some parts, like in Tamil Nadu, the dominance of the Brahmin ownership of the economy was huge. Some historians have calculated it was 90%. Well, it was certainly very large. Now, the Buddhist monasteries don't do that because when they are donated land, it's donated to the monastery. It doesn't become a hereditary possession. And the monasteries do not become landlords. So that this element of feudalization that takes place in Indian society is restricted to Puranic Hinduism and not so much to Buddhism. I mean, some people like Max Weber have referred to monastic landlordism. But monastic landlordism is a different kind of thing. And this, in a sense, was what pushed Buddhism eastwards into Bengal, into areas that were still being opened up, uh, but which gave uh, a certain advantage uh, to, to the uh, Puranic Hinduism, which then became the dominant religion. And Yes, caste was involved in this conversion. When the Brahman moved in and became a landowner, uh, he introduced caste, and there was a hierarchy introduced as well. So this is why I was interested to know whether the same thing happened under the Funan dynasty and the Champa dynasty here, which had Brahmins as performers of rituals. Uh, but you know, this is something that needs investigation. Yes, caste was introduced. And that is one reason why uh, the spread of Buddhism became much easier, because it didn't carry all this baggage of caste and land ownership and so on. It established itself in a new place, set up a monastery, and began teaching the religion. That may be one explanation for why it spread, why Buddhism initially spread, and then later on, of course, Quranic Hinduism followed in its footsteps. The Indian influence, civilizational influence on Southeast Asia, as I tried to suggest, that really what we have to look at is the parallels, if any, between the way in which Indian civilization, however one defines it, spread in the Indian subcontinent and the neighborhood, and how it spread, to what degree it spread in Southeast Asia. It is not identical, but I think there is something comparable in what I was referring to as the process of historical change. And that process of historical change, I think, needs to be studied. The reason why I say it needs to be studied is that the foundational studies have been carried out in terms of saying that there were Indian elements, there were Indian influences, there are monuments. But what we haven't really studied is why these influences were different, and what historical role did these influences play. You do not get a monument like Borobudur anywhere in India. And the question is why? You've got Buddhism, you've got the practices of Buddhism, we know the kind of Buddhism that spread there. One has to answer the question of why you only get Borobudur in Indonesia and you don't get it in India. Similarly, many other monuments where changes have been made. So it's that element that I think really needs to be studied, that we must move away from now from saying this was Chinese, this was Indian, this was this, and really look at the way in which a region articulates its culture in a particular form. Um, and this links to the question about further India, too, because in the old tradition, they talked about further India as being an extension of Indian civilization per se, whereas we are now arguing that it is an extension of some elements of the Indian civilization. And what we are interested in is what did the local people do with these elements that came in. That's the way in which we would express the difference from earlier scholarship and what we are doing. On the question of the Marxist interpretation, yes, there has been, in fact, a very substantial Marxist interpretation of the whole of Indian history. 
um, where the emphasis is really on the fact that you know the Marxist interpretation is a method of analyzing in which things like labor, resources, uh, the domination of some groups and the subordination of other groups is important. So this has been looked at. We have got one absolutely outstanding Marxist historian by the name of Didi Kosambi, uh, who really completely revolutionized our approach to the understanding of uh, the Indian history. So it's not that the Marxist interpretation has not been used, it's just that um, Indian Marxists tend to use it very differently from the way European Marxists use Marx's interpretation for Europe. And I think that Marx would be the first person to say this is perfectly legitimate. He has given a method, and it is for people to use that method and adapt that method as and where they choose to do so. And that method has, in fact, been used in the context of Indian history. Early India. This is a term which uh, my colleagues accuse me of having invented myself. Uh, what do I mean? I, early India, is, I just got fed up of this whole business of ancient India, medieval India, modern India, Hindu India, Muslim India, British India, and so on. Early India is my understanding of everything that is pre-Islamic, but not necessarily Hindu. So it incorporates uh, Brahmanism, it incorporates the opposition to Brahmanism, which is very important, which we underplay all the time. We treat Buddhism and Jainism as, you know, subsets of Hinduism, which is not true. They are in opposition to Brahmanism, they're in opposition. And Puranic Hinduism, for example, when it borrows the organization of the Buddhist Sangha, it is at the same time abusing the Buddha. Um, the Buddha is referred to in the Quranic text as the great deluder, the man who produced delusion and led people off the right path. So there's a very strong opposition there which, which carries on. Um, and really the use of the term early then is a kind of shorthand for saying uh, that I don't approve of the earlier periodization, but I haven't worked out a new periodization to replace it as yet. When I do that, I'll stop using the term early and, and remember. Um, uh, the cradle, um, that is something that historians are now moving away from. You know, there used to be the Mesopotamian cradle and the Egyptian cradle and so on. Uh, we are now, as I was saying in, in my talk, that we don't regard civilization as being created in one area because civilization itself is the end product of lots of influences coming in and lots of ideas coming in and going out and so on. It's the mixing up of cultures that produces a civilization. Therefore, the notion of a single cradle doesn't really work. Now, if you apply this to the question of the origin of uh, the species of human movement, uh, which, as you rightly say, used to be uh, primitive man in the Paleolithic, has now become Lucy, the African woman, who moved out of, the, of um, Tanzania and moved in different directions. And there was a time when uh, Lucy was regarded as the mother of all human races. Uh, this is now being countered in the sense that there are people, ethnologists, who are saying there wasn't one Lucy, there were multiple Lucys in many parts of the world. So what you get is uh, certain areas and certain peoples where the initial homo sapiens working into the Paleolithic takes place, but not in one area. It's not a migration from Africa out. It's multiple areas, five, six, all across the world. So that also ties in with the notion of multiple cradles, if you want to use the term of the cradle. Um, yes, the process of history, as I was trying to say, is really, it's a way of looking at the continuities of the past. That is that you don't just say the past is out there and is another country, as somebody said, and we study it as an object. But we look at the past as being a part of us in the present, and maybe also giving some direction to the future. Therefore, the change is now from not just the narrative of the past, 
But what do we understand of the past? And in the process of understanding, as new and new evidence comes out, as new and new theories are developed, our understanding will change. But that process is the process which really is essential to the study of history.